we thank you for this word this morning, God. And we thank you, Father, that you have a good plan for those of us that you have saved and set free and called out of darkness into your marvelous light. I speak to the ears, Father God, of each hearer and say that, Father, in the name of Jesus, those that have an ear to hear, let them hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Your word says that faith comes by hearing. So, Father, I thank you for a supernatural deposit of faith that is going to be left, Father God, inside each hearer of this word, no matter when it's heard. And finally, God, we don't desire to be hearers only of your word, but doers as well. I thank you that you have purposed these people to do great works for your name so that you might receive glory for them, God. I speak life into everyone sitting here and everyone listening. The love of God, the identity that comes from being with God and in God, the faith from God, and the eternal purpose that he has given us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say how much I love and appreciate each of you. Thank you for being here. And I'm excited to let you know about your purpose today, that you have a purpose, that you're not an accident, that you were born for a reason, a great reason, okay? You serve a great God who does big and mighty things, and you were born as well for a great reason. This ministry right now is all about life and rest, and this, this church might be full of banners one day, is what Sister Linda said, but right now he's given us the revelation of both life and rest. Can you say relationship? See, this is the relationship God desires that you have with him through his son, Jesus Christ, because your old life's no good. We needed to be born again. We were born into sin, and we needed some help because uh, the wages of sin equals death, but the gift of God is eternal what? Life. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he has come that we might have what? Life and might have life more abundantly. So the revelation he's given me about life is that he wants us to walk in his love, his identity, his faith, and his eternal purpose for our lives. You can't walk out your purpose unless you're walking in the love of God, unless you've embraced your identity in God, unless you're, unless you're exercising your faith in God as well. This is discipleship. Can you say discipleship? All right, so God has given us life, and the way that we live our life is through rest, not stress, not work, not our own works, but through rest. Can you say it like that? Rest. Such a beautiful word. Just the, just the thought that's out there, just, I'm just thinking about how much I love naps right now, and I pray that I could have one later. Anyway, rest. So, we don't live by our ideas because our ideas are messy and junky and they can fail. We live by the word of God. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God's mouth. So in order to enter into his rest by faith, he has to do all the work. He wrote our story and he wants to do all the work through us. So we can just rest and say, God, I trust that you're working out everything for my good. So we live by revelation, what he says empowerment. Empowerment happens when we believe what he says. Then he'll give us a strategy or the know-how in every single circumstance through his word, and then he calls us, us to triumph. So where we are right now in the series is eternal purpose. Every single one of you were born for a purpose. And the, the message title this morning is For Goodness Sake. Can you say for goodness sake? For goodness sake. And I want you to know that that every single problem that you're going through right now, if you could just count it all joy and just be determined that, you know what, I'm just going through this for goodness sake. That's it, for the sake of his goodness, for the sake of his glory. It doesn't feel good on this side of it. It doesn't feel good in the trial period or the testing period, but joy will come in the morning. Let me just see where I am today, if I'm talking to the right crowd. Uh, have any of you ever had any help from God? If you could just raise your hand. Has he ever helped you out of a situation? All right, I'm in the right place. All right. So, for goodness sake, we're in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and I've got to give a disclaimer before I preach this. As I preach this word, the only way that this um, relates to you 
is if you're born again. You must be born again for the word of God to be effective in your life, okay? So this is very, it's very important that you understand that all these promises and your eternal purpose doesn't kick in until you're born again. See, I graduated from Shawnee, and I've got a classmate. I think you're, you're a year behind me, were you? Two years or so? And she said, woohoo, go Indians, okay? Uh, I graduated from Shawnee in 95, was supposed to play basketball for Ohio Northern and graduate from there and get a big paying job and move off and never come back to Lima. That was my plan, all right? But God had another plan, right? For goodness sake. Can you say for goodness sake? I really want this to sink in today because some of you are looking at your problems like, ugh. But you just need to turn them around and consider them joy and say, you know what? For goodness sake. I want that to be your response from now on. Just for goodness sake, all right? We're in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Can you say this with me? Father, thank you for the new nature. Whew. We would be in a lot of trouble without that new nature, the divine nature that he's given us. Verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much. That's what we were just singing about. Oh, how he loves us. What'd he do? That even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us what? Life. When he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms. And that's where we have to start living from, brothers and sisters, from the heavenly realms. When you begin to live from the heavenly realms, you have a different perspective. When you begin to begin to re realize and remember that you're seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly realms, you're able to say that no matter what's going on, it's for what? Goodness sake. All right, let's continue. Verse 7. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples. Say this with me. I am an example. See, that's one of your purposes. Your purpose is to be an example of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. If you want more glorious and awesome things to begin to happen for you in your life, then you need to focus more. Remember, focus, freedom of choice under stress, because problems are going to keep coming. You can't be saved enough for your problems to stop. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit enough for your problems to stop. Because the Word of God says this, uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers us from how many? All of them. So problems are going to come, but solutions are going to come as well, for goodness sake. Let's continue. Verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. His workmanship. Let's pause there. Say this with me. I am God's workmanship. Those of you that can stand, I want you to stand. And I want you to say this again, and I want it to sink in, and I want, I want you to agree, come into agreement with heaven, come into agreement with his word, come into agreement with God's purpose for you. Let's say it again. I am God's workmanship. All right, have a seat. And we're going to go deeper into that in a little while. But yes, you are. You are not the devil's workmanship. You are not anyone else's workmanship. You are God's workmanship. All right, his masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus 
so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So listen to that. We've got an eternal purpose. Before he ever made the world, he had an idea and a purpose about you, and he had these good works planned that he would do through you long ago. Long ago. Before there was an ocean for Damien to stand in and allow the waves to hit upon him, I was a thought in God's mind, and he knew that he'd meet me there one moment. One moment was orchestrated. One moment was planned that I'd be standing there, and he'd be hitting me wave after wave after wave, and I'd get that revelation to tell his people that that kind of mercy and love is available for all of us because I was his plan and so were you. You were planned. None of you were a mistake. I don't care if your parents planned you or not. I don't care how you got here. Some of us get so discouraged about the how we got here. Don't worry about the how. Worry about the why. The why you're here. And you're here for God's purpose, but it all starts with being born again in Christ. So our key scripture today is Ephesians 2.10. What's the key scripture? Ephesians 2.10. And I, I, I like class participation because it keeps you awake and it keeps me focused and fueled. Ephesians 2 and 10. All right. So it says, for we, and this is the New King James Version. It says, for we are his. So let's pause right there. We're going to break down this scripture and then we're going to go live it out. For we are his. So let's go to Romans chapter 8. Verses 12 through 17, and we're going to establish that we are his, all right? Those of you that take notes, praise God, continue to take notes. But those of you don't, I challenge you to listen to this message again and let it be deposited into your spirit that the enemy can't rob you of any of it. Uh, because you, in your own mind, sometimes can't retain every single thing that God is giving right now, but it's being recorded on Facebook and on YouTube and even CDs back there, so you can get it again. We're in Romans chapter 8, verse 12. We're trying to establish, Ephesians 2 and 10 says, for we are his. So we want to establish God's ownership of our lives. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit, ooh, that's key, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. That's how we put to death the deeds of our sinful nature, by the power of the Spirit. Listen, you cannot will to not sin. You hear what I'm saying? You can want to not sin, but you can't will it. The only way that we can kill or keep at bay that sinful nature is through the power of the Spirit. Let's continue. But if, you, if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. This is key. This is how we establish uh, God as being our Father and we are His. This is the DNA test of whether we belong to God or not. It says this, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So listen, freedom came in this verse because it said that we have no obligation to fulfill our sinful nature. No obligation at all. We've got freedom in Christ. We don't have to sin. But if we're going to be the sons and daughters of God, we have to be led by His Spirit. Verse 15, so, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. I think we sang that today as well. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Can you say this? For goodness sake. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And that's one thing this flesh doesn't like to do, but it's going to have to be made to suffer so that God can get some glory from our situation. So, 
I think we've established very well the beginning of Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his. And Romans 8, 12 through 17 says that all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Now let's continue. We're continuing to break down Ephesians 2.10. And now we're going to get to the part it says, for we are his workmanship. Can you say workmanship? Now let me tell you how awesome this word uh, is. And here's what it means. It is something effected, made, or produced. It is the art or skill of a workman. And here's my favorite part. Also, the quality imparted to a thing in the process of making. So if we are the workmanship of God, then we are very high quality. We are very powerful. We are very loving. We are very caring. If we allow his workmanship to shine through us, if we allow the way that God created us, if we allow ourselves to align with his purpose for our lives, we become his workmanship. Let's listen to how David described it in Psalms chapter 139, beginning in verse 13. It says this, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You washed me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not a reject. You are not a mess up. You are not your sins that you have made, you have, uh, you have committed. You have been wiped clean and you are his workmanship and he wants to use you. Can you say this with me? God desires to use me. You didn't sound very enthusiastic about that, but uh, it's kind of important that you realize that that's what you're here for is to serve God. Not for him to serve us, he will, but the most important thing we must realize is that we are here to serve him. All right, we are still talking about being his workmanship, so I've got some good news for you as being his workmanship. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28, says this. He is the workman, okay? And we are his workmanship. So listen to this. And we know that God causes everything, how many things? God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. This is excellent news. Please get this revelation that if you've been born again and if you've laid down your life for God and you said, God, use my life for your glory and for your purpose, then it doesn't matter. No matter what you're going through, he will cause all things to work together for good. Why? Because we are his workmanship. And the reason that he created us was for his glory. So I wish I could convince about two or three people in this room right now that no matter what you're going through, that if you are living your life according to the purpose that God has planned for you, that everything's going to work together for good. It's like pieces of a puzzle. You can't see the whole puzzle. See, it just arrives as a problem, but God is very particular about getting glory. Very particular. So the problem arrives, just one little piece of the puzzle arrives, and you look at that thing and say, God, why did you send this thing to my life? God, why, why is this troubling my life? Why is this here? Because your, your perspective is just like this. But if you, and through the course of time, it'll happen, you'll be able to step back from the picture, see what God is doing, 
and see how that was just a little piece of the puzzle of your life that made it all so glorious for God in the end. Don't get caught up on the pieces. Just know that God has a process and that in the end of this thing that he's going to call all these things to work together for good. How many are willing to believe that? That no matter what you're going through right now, that he's going to cause it to work together for good. All right. That's Romans 8, 28. Ephesians 2 and 10, again, we're moving on. So we've talked about for we are his. We established the ownership. We talked about workmanship and what that means, that God created us and he's given us specific things to, to accomplish. And now we're in the part of Ephesians 2.10 where it says created in Christ Jesus. That's very important. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, it's not about being created. It's about being recreated. It's not about being born. It's about being born again. Because that is what starts the new life. Oh my goodness. I don't know where I'd be right now if I had not been born again, but it wouldn't be here. Last night probably would have been full of sin. I know it would have been. Full of sin, full of mess, all right? But God saved me for his purpose. God saved us all for his purpose. God doesn't just save us as a fire insurance policy. God doesn't just save us so that we don't have to go to hell. God saves us to give us a purpose so that we might share in the glory of Jesus Christ. So that is why Paul was able to say, I'd rather boast in all of my infirmities because I understand that my problems have been written into the story and every single one of my problems has a glorious ending for God. You have to receive this revelation. I know it might seem heavy, but it shouldn't be. Every single problem was written into the story because God is the author and the finisher of your faith. He wrote your story. Nothing that you go through surprises him. He knows it all, and he has deposited in each and every one of us a measure of faith so that when we come to that particular circumstance or, 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 or problem, that it's not, our faith is not going to be a dud, but it's going to be fireworks. It's going to release glory into the heavens for God. Problems, we need our problems. This is, this is hard to preach, Lord. Are you sure you want me to tell him that? We need our problems for God to get glory. We need impossible situations, and we need people to know about our impossible situations so that God gets glory from them. Uh, as I laid in the hospital with kidney failure, I had a coworker come uh, and visit me, a man that has been in many wars, seen much death, and he came, at, I didn't even know he was there, I was so out of it, and dying. He came into my room, he looked at me, and uh, walked away, and later on, he called me and said, Damien, I've seen a lot of death. I've seen a lot of dying people. I've watched people die in front of me, seen a lot of it. And he said, when I saw you, I knew that would be the last time I saw you alive. Wow, that's a problem. But you know what? For goodness sake, for the sake of his goodness, for the sake of his glory, because he knew that I wouldn't hide it and that I would testify about it. Some of you haven't graduated from the problem that you're in because you haven't even begun to testify and glorify God and all the things that he's done already. You, we, we have such short-term memory sometimes. I don't know why it is that the new problem seems to erase all the answers and solutions that he's ever done for us before. He loads us daily with benefits. He's so good. And I'm sorry, I wish I could preach. No, I don't. I'm just going to tell you that how it is. The only way God's going to get glory through your life is through problems, circumstances, situations, and they're going to be public. 
People are going to see you have these problems. They're going to see your kids acting up. They're going to see the car break down. They're going to see you sick. They're going to see you worried. They're going to see these uh, problems in your life. All so that your purpose can be fulfilled. Your purpose is that God would get glory from your life. That no matter what the situation was and the impossibility of it, that God stepped in and said, Lazarus, come forth. Or whatever your name is. He said, come forth for his glory. There's just no other way. If we're going to reign with him, we must suffer as well. All right. So we're in Ephesians 2.10 now. We've established we are his. We've established what workmanship means. We've established created in Christ Jesus, which means being born again and receiving the new life. And now we're to the part where it says for good works. All right. So we're breaking this thing down. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? good works. For what? Good works. What were you created in Christ Jesus for? Good works. So we've got work to do, and it's good work. You hear what I'm saying? It's awesome work, because we serve a mighty God, and no matter how impossible the situation seems, or how insurmountable the workload is, God's going to show up because he wrote the story. You should just find so much comfort and joy that God wrote your story and that he's going to uh, include a glorious ending for every situation that you're going through. So we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. All right. We are his workmanship. So let's see what that uh, entails. We know that we've been born again in Jesus Christ for good works. All right, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. So I'm talking to each of you right now. You are his workmanship, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about yourself, okay? Here's what he thinks of you and, and desires from you. You are the light of the world. What are you? You are the light of the world. You are a city that is set on a hill. What are you? You are a city that's set on a hill. And listen to this. A city that's set on a hill, everybody's going to see what happens to that city. Publicly. Some of you have been through foreclosure publicly. Some of you have been through getting electricity cut off publicly. Some of you have been through marital problems publicly. Because you are a city that's set upon a hill that cannot be hid. See, God likes showing off. Have you ever seen the northern lights? Those are beautiful. He likes showing off. You ever seen a beautiful sunset? A waterfall? An ocean? You ever seen those things? God, he just desires glory. And so that's why he's written these glorious situations into our our lives, okay? So you are the light of the world, and you are a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. All right. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, so God's not going to hide you, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light, here's your eternal purpose, okay? There's many scriptures relating to eternal purpose. Here's one of the main ones, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What good works? Where are these good works coming from? Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Praise God. You should, be, you, be, you should begin to get so excited about life right now because you were created for good works. That God had a good plan for each and every one of you. All right? Thank you, brother. I needed that. <laughs> All right. Let's keep going. Uh, you Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I told you God's after glory. He's after glory. And the good works that he's assigned to your life 
are going to bring him glory. These good works are impossible situations that could not have been done without the help of God. Uh, we have a lady sitting on the back row. Can you wave your hand, Miss Allen? All right. Cancer free still? Praise God. Can we give God praise for that? And you're thinking, well, what in the world does she have to do with being cancer free? Ah, let me read it again. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I'm not saying that God gave her cancer, but what I am saying is that God gave her an answer. That rhymes. You can use that if you want. He gave the solution that no weapon that's formed against us will prosper because we're made for good works. You've just got to know that and get that down in your spirit that I am his workmanship created for good works. These bad and evil things, they cannot, they, they, they might happen to me, but they won't be the end of me. These things might happen to me, but they're happening for goodness sake. So that's what you, if you, if you want to push God a little forward, if you want to get his attention a little more, just say things like this. Instead of complaining about your problems, you should do something like this. Hey, God, uh, I got something you can get glory from. Hey, I got a situation that's going on right now that you can get some glory. God, you want some glory? <laughs> yeah, he wants glory. What's his word say? He looks over his word to perform it. So what you need to do, see, so we're, we're in the strategy portion of eternal purpose. I already told you about revelation, what it means. I told you about empowerment. Last week was empowerment, which was through our weaknesses. He, he's, he gives us his strength. And now I'm telling you about the strategy. I'm telling you how to effectively walk out your eternal purpose. And it's this. It's saying, God, I want this situation I'm going through that you wrote anyway. I want this to give you glory. I don't see how you're going to use it. It's so ugly. And here's, here's what God does. He gives us beautiful things in ugly packages. Sister Allen, was that an ugly package? But, but are you so very thankful right now for God and his love for you? Is your family thankful? Greg, are you thankful for what he did for your wife? ugly package. It was such an ugly package, but once it's unwrapped, we begin to see that all things work together for good for all those that love God and have been called according to his purpose. So what's your purpose? That you would do good works and that men would see them and then glorify your father in heaven. Sister Allen has a testimony that she should go to her deathbed singing because it will give God glory every time she says it. Listen to this. We overcome by our testimonies. So listen, everything that God has delivered you from, you need to be telling people, telling people, because what that does is it releases glory to God. And they say, wow. You see, God's grace is all over us once we go through the storm and come out, people aren't going to believe the kind of storm you came out of. How do I know? The Hebrew boys, they did not smell like smoke, and their clothes were not touched by fire, and the only thing that was burnt up in that fire were the ropes that had them bound. That's the only thing that gets burnt up when it's for his glory. So, so, so here's the beauty of her testimony. The cancer was the only thing that got destroyed and not her. She went through the fire, and the purpose was for God's glory. Sister Sopo's back there clapping right now. They said that she'd have to have a heart, a heart surgery, but her heart was too weak for the surgery. Have you had a surgery yet? Are you still here and alive and kicking? All right, for God's glory. All these problems... They, we don't like them when we get them, but afterwards, it's that thing that we can't stop praising God about, all right? So we need to reverse this thing and begin praising him in advance and say, God, I believe that you wrote this for your own glory. Let's finish up. All right. 
So uh, the good works is what we just talked about. And Matthew 5, 16, that's our license plate on the church van as well. Uh, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, and we talked about also that, um, that we're a city on a hill in the light of the world, and that means even at your jobs. Can you say strategy? That's what we're talking about today. How do we do this thing? All right? The darkest place you, many of you will go is to work. It's one of the darkest places you'll go, and you'll spend 40 hours a week there or more sometimes. It's one of the darkest places that there is is work. And that is because we are surrounded by unbelievers, and, but, but yet God has placed us there to be a light. Who's the light at their job? Every single one of you should be raising your hand if you're working. Who was a light at their job? Let me get the retirees involved, all right? We have to take advantage of every single lampstand God gives us. So if you don't work, it could be Walmart while you're shopping. It doesn't matter. Your light doesn't go out. You're the light of the world every single place that you go, and your good work should glorify God. So what are some examples of some good works? Paying for somebody's grocery, holding the door open for somebody, love and compassion and kindness. Those are the good works that get people's attention in the dark world. A small light, if you light a match in a dark room, people are going to take notice. So if you do one act of kindness, one good work in this world, they're going to take notice. And what you have to be careful of is to not rob God of the glory of that moment and say, well, God bless you. God bless you. He loves you so much. Just a word of encouragement. Amen. All right. Our last portion of the verse is, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay. So God prepared these works, these good works for us to do uh, even beforehand so that we sh could walk in them. Uh, I'll give an example here of, uh, in John chapter 9. We're just going to read a couple verses in John chapter 9 about a man that was born blind. Okay? John chapter 9, verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Can you say, for goodness sake? I want to teach you how to respond for goodness sake, no matter what it is, okay? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Jesus responded in this way. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. Did you know that was in the Bible? We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. What is he talking about? Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When we stand in front of God at the end of time, we want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What is he saying was done well? What's he talking about? Ephesians 2.10, that those good works that have been assigned to our lives beforehand, that we would walk them out. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. I want to pray over you and I want to send you out armed with this knowledge of Ephesians 2 and 10 make that your scripture of your of the week make it the scripture of a lifetime that you are created in his workmanship amen so father I just pray for these purposes that are standing in this room right now there is there are none of us too young and none of us too old to walk out the purpose that you have planned for us in Jesus Christ. May we not be hearers of the word only, but doers, God. Father, I'm just, I just see, I just see uh, us at the end of time standing before you, and I, I thank you for this sermon right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for this message that brings us focus back into our lives that we're not here to live for us. We didn't create ourselves. We're not our own workmanship. 
We're God's workmanship, created for good works in Jesus Christ. And you knew beforehand what they would be. So, Father, here's my prayer for these people, that you would give them rest. You would help them to have a revelation, empowerment, strategy, and triumph in every situation in their lives. And every waking moment that they have, may they realize that they are the salt of the world and the lights of the world. May they recognize every time, even at lunch, at the grocery store, at work, wherever they are, they are the lights of the world who have been created for God to accomplish good works. Keep us in tune, Father, with our work, because honestly, sometimes, Lord, we get so busy and focused on ourselves that we walk right by our purposes. We leave our good works undone because we have ourselves in mind only. So, Father, in Jesus' name, may an anointing of awareness come upon each of us so that you can have a return of your investment of glory. And we pray these things right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God some praise this morning. Can you say for goodness sake one more time? You see, your stories have been written. That's what David said in Psalms. You, you wrote all my days in front of me before I even got there. You had wrote them out. So there's nothing that you are going to face that God doesn't know about. And you have the faith inside of you to withstand it so that if you just hold on, hold on a little bit longer, glory is going to explode in the situation and God is going to uh, bring relief. So we must just begin to remind ourselves that it's for goodness sake, that he doesn't write bad endings. He writes glorious endings for each of us. Amen. You may be 